What's up, everybody? Welcome to another edition of the Post Game Podcast. I'm your host, Corey Smith, here with Michael Clark, football analyst for Pack Pride. Michael, NC State just sealed a 20 to 6 win over Miami to clinch bowl eligibility, give Dave Jordan a 78th win, which is a program record now, his 101st win overall uh, in his coaching career. And like I said, get NC State a, a win over Miami, which is the first time it's happened in the Dave Jordan era and four chances. So just your thoughts on this one first before we jump into things, man. You know, I think I was completely wrong. I'm going to be honest. Two, three weeks ago when they lost to Duke 24-3, to if you were going to tell me that they were going to beat Clemson and Miami back-to-back, I know the games are at home, I would have said 1% chance. Like, I, I yeah. maybe – and I don't – and I really don't think I was in the minority. I don't know how you felt, but I think most people felt that way. Yeah, yeah, I think here you are, and you've won two games with no offense for the most part, and you've leaned on your defense. And and you know, I'm gonna put this in my takeaways. I know that Tony Gibson just got an extension in the offseason, but I ripped that contract up immediately, and I would he, he deserves more money. I mean, this is incredible what he's doing. And, you know, Corey, what he's doing, it's, he's not doing it with consensus five-star guys and four-star guys. He's doing it with guys they've recruited. They've developed a couple of key additions from the portal. Um, it's just a masterful plan, back-to-back weeks, and the guys have gone out and executed. I don't I, – there's nothing I can say that can um, – it's just this defense has just been outstanding. Yeah, I mean, that obviously I want to talk about the defense here in just a second, but – Uh, Before we get things started, I want to remind our listeners, as always, visit our iTunes, Google Play Store, and go to YouTube. If you're watching this on YouTube, make sure that you go over there, like, and subscribe it, hit get notifications, so you can jump on these every single time that we start one of these, Uh, but also, you know, make uh, make sure that you get the word out there to the rest of Wolfpack Nation, so we can get as many people on these each and every single time we start. Usually, we end up with, like, well over 100 people that watch these things. As you can tell, I'm a little bit on the mend myself, uh, but it's a uh, we'll, we'll we'll get through this and find a way. Uh, but also make sure to check out all of Pack Pride's coverage throughout the rest of football season and basketball offseason. That ends uh, in a couple of days when NC State starts on Monday night uh, when it comes to basketball on Tuesday night for women's basketball. But it's $1 for the first month or 30% off for one year. Great time to get started, guys. If you haven't jumped on Pack Pride, uh, you get not only Pack Pride, but the entire 24 7 sports network. Uh, so make sure that you head over to packpride.com to find out more about becoming a premium subscriber. All right, Michael. So I said I wanted to start with the defensive side of the football. Uh, this is, you know, the second straight week we'll start with defense, but uh, there's a big reason for that. And it's because of the fact that this defense just held what was the number 21 overall scoring offense in the country? What was the number. Two or three, I don't know exactly where they were statistically when the, when they headed into this game, but one of the top scoring offenses in the ACC, and they held them to zero touchdowns, two field goals on the night, uh, held them to four of, let's see, what was it, four of 17 on third and fourth down, and held them to an average of 4.2 yards per play on a total of 70 plays. So this is the second straight week that NC State's going out there for 70-plus plays, and they held an offense to – I said held the Hurricanes to a sprinkle uh, in my postgame takeaways. But uh, just your thoughts on on the defensive performance overall for them. Yeah, I said it was a masterful game plan by Tony Gibson, but it was a true team effort by the players. I mean, Peyton Wilson is the headliner and for good reason. And just when you think you have seen it all, he goes out and finishes, what is it, 15, 6, 16 tackles. I believe that's a season high for him. Season high um, was uh, second in his career, uh, 19 against Duke that 2020 season. But, you know, you go through this game, Corey, you've got four turnovers forced. I'm looking at the defense right now. I mean, there were so many guys from Jalen Scott, Shaheen Battle, Devin Boyk, and Aiden White. I mean, I go down the list of all these guys who played such vital roles in this win, and it just um, – it's a true team effort and just a lot of really good players. And it, it's just – when you watch them, they play so hard. They play for each other. And when you see teams who typically do that, they typically mac- maximize the uh, potential that they have. And I, I think this defense is really running on all cylinders. We talk about it every week. It is so hard to play defense in uh, college football right now. I mean, you're seeing every week 50, 60 points being scored all over the country. 
and here NC State is leaning on that defense. And uh, yeah, I think you look at the final three games. Could you lose all three? Certainly, but this defense is going to keep you in it. And there's not a game left on the schedule that really makes you. I mean, are you worried about it? I don't think so. Yeah, I mean, if I had to say there was two teams that I was really worried about, if you looked at the end of the the, the last game, five games of the schedule, obviously, mm-hmm. you know, you, UNC has a pretty potent offense, but you know, the defense is susceptible as long as NC State can find ways. You know this defense is able to shut down just about anybody in the country, if not anybody in the country, as they've proven over the last several weeks. But, you know, the offense needs, still needs to find its way, and we'll talk about that in a second. But, yeah, I mean, that's the thing about it. Like, right now – these were the two teams that I was like, man, if NC State's going to lose to any two teams, it's probably going to be these two. They have to find a way to win two out of the last three and then, you know, get to bowl eligibility. They come out of the gate. I mean, I said this in my post-game takeaways like eight days ago, eight days ago at this time, NC State was the, the season was completely on the mend. They're four and three overall. They have a losing record in the ACC. And somehow or another, they're able to figure things out, get back to, uh, the two wins now at this point and turn the season around again, bowl eligibility might not seem like a big deal, but like we were talking about it during the bye week like it's, it's not Boy, a guarantee. Could have spiraled yep. out of control. And I think that is, is where, where things are. And I think if you really look at this defense for as bad offensively as state has been of late, and, and I've been a big critic of how bad they are situationally, just the lack of awareness, the lack of execution, on the opposite side with Tony Gibson, the adjustments he makes and, you know, that teams have had some success running the football, throwing the football. But situationally on defense, they are outstanding. Third down defense, you know, they were 13th in the country going in. That will probably move up after this. I mean, that's the money down, and that's how you get off, yep. field, off the field. You can, you know, have teams run up and down the field only throw – pass after pass complete. But if you're not giving up touchdowns and holding teams to field goals, it is huge in games like this. And just in an ACC that uh, I think we, outside of Florida State, we really, it's really hard to grasp, I think, uh, uh, what you have, if that makes sense. Yeah, and I mean, I'll I'll take a look at it once we get done with all this. But, you know, right now, I know obviously Louisville's kind of put themselves as the the class outside of. You're kicking uh, yourself over that one. Yeah. Oh, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's the thing. That that is one of the most brutal losses you could have if you really go back and look at it with what is on the line, given the divisions are no longer when it comes to one and two. I think that's the one you're going to look back on and be like, wow. Um, Yeah. It's just unfortunate. Yeah, and at the same time, I mean, you know, continuing on the defensive side of the football, I wanted to give a shout-out to, you know, (laughs) the guys that came away with interceptions. Like, it's one thing that we come away – we head into this game, and I said over and over and over again, and you said a few times, like, the focal point for this was you have to be able to come away with interceptions. You have to be able to force Miami into mistakes. They've done it, and when they've done it consistently, they've, you know, it, it ends up leading to losses. I believe they had five against UNC in that loss. Uh, they had multiple, I think it was like three or four against Georgia Tech. I might be flipping those, but – Again, those were that was the way that teams forced them into losses. And for NC State, they come away with three interceptions, another forced fumble, uh, which leads to – or actually, I, I think it was uh, no, the punt return um, to hit off the face mask, and it led to um, NC State getting uh, the flip the field there too. So this is all, you know, like you've got to be able to step up in those moments. And it's easy to say that going into the game – but like Aiden White coming away with that, you know, athletic interception that he had in the end zone uh, for a guy like Devin Boykin to be able to come down with a second straight interception uh, for second straight week. Like, look, they're, they're ones that landed right in, <laughs> right in his breadbasket. But at the same time, you've got to come down with those. Like we've seen those those plays be missed so many times over the years that when you see them happen, it's huge. And then Brandon Cisse putting the exclamation point on it. Uh, with that final interception, his first interception, I believe, of his career, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, speaking of two first touchdowns for uh, Jordan Poole and uh, and Kendrick Raphael. Which we'll Who had about. Jordan Poole scoring the t- a touchdown tonight? Uh, I mean, that's what I said. <laughs> I said. I said if you had Jordan Poole scoring a touchdown uh, on, a, on a on his first ever touch uh, receiving, not even rushing the football, but receiving on your bingo card, then you're a liar. So. <laughs> Just a uh, a weird night all the way around, but man, you know, again, this is a it's it's a recipe for a win for NC State. And as Dave Doran said last week, like 
we're just going to go in every single week and go, how do we beat this team? How do we beat this team? How do we beat this team? And if you're looking at it, this is exactly how you beat Miami. Yeah, I, I, I don't – it's just, to me, in the current state of college football, the lack of offensive just – firepower and being able to beat win these two games i know clemson is down miami's not where they need to be yet Corey. but <laughs> yeah i mean you go down the the stat sheet and outside kevin conception you are i mean severely limited would be putting it nicely i'm just going through the numbers right now i it is it's impressive that they're able to keep winning and and you know i think the staff deserves a lot of credit and you know, Dave Dorn's been a guy who's has had his fair share of criticism from you, myself, and the rest of the media. But, I mean, I'd argue this is one of the better coaching jobs he has done to come off a devastating loss like that against Duke. I mean, a demoralizing defeat. I mean, you could not yeah. have been any worse than they were. And he said, against, he said the exact same thing, yeah. Yeah, so you, you are able to get your guys to bounce back and win against Clemson. You win against Miami. I think we know that the games were at home. But I go back to my initial thought that the chances were slim to none in my eyes. And I think, you know, we talk a lot throughout the week off air. We were on the same wavelength. Like, this thing could really spiral <laughs> in a bad way. And here you are. I'm not saying you're going to be playing Florida State for the conference championship, but you went out and you at least put yourself in the conversation. I know we're a long ways from that, but you have gotten through really two tough tests. We know the history at Wake Forest, not to digress. But um, I'm encouraged. I can't believe we're sitting here <laughs> compared to where we were three weeks ago. Yeah. I screwed that up earlier, by the way. We were also watching a game. I don't remember exactly who it was, but one of the games that we were watching that was on one of the screens during halftime had a, uh, had a, a botched punt return that hit off the face mask. The, the actual uh, turnover, the fumble for NC State was Red Hibbler uh, with the mm -hmm. strip sack, and then Davin Van comes away with it. Davin Van gets his own – uh, sack later in the game. So again, this, you know, this defensive line continued to be impressive. You know, you came into this game going, all right, this is number three and number two uh, in the ACC in sacks and NC State comes away uh, with three sacks in this game compared to two for Miami. You know, look, the offensive line was, was far from perfect on the night, yeah. Uh, yeah. but gave up some, gave up some pretty bad sacks on this one. But at the same time, this was a, uh, you know, Again, this is a chance for NC State to come away with a strong win. I wanted to go back to the offensive side of the football because obviously MJ Moore is not a perfect night for him, and and you know we'll continue to talk about that uh, as as things roll along for him. And he's he's got to get better. Like it's just being honest, he's got to get better. Uh, one touchdown, one interception for him tonight. There's a couple other opportunities where he probably could have had some big plays, uh, didn't quite come to fruition for him. But you know he's got to get better. One guy I wanted to focus on here. And we don't really talk about him a whole lot, but a guy in Brennan Armstrong that you know just continues to do what this team needs to be done. Uh, just your thoughts on on his performance tonight, and you know guys in that ground game because Kendra Graffiel, another tough run for him that leads to his first ever interception. I mean, first ever touchdown. So, just your thoughts on them too. I think Brennan Armstrong deserves a ton of credit. It shows um, maturity and being able to handle adversity. I mean. To, to come in, earn the starting job, be named the captain, and lose your your job. And, and he needed to go to the bench. He was not playing well. But to fight through it and still have the attitude and the mental just toughness to go to practice every day and everything you hear behind the scenes is he's been great to MJ. And then being more of a factor in the game plan each week and handling it. I mean, he was really impressive tonight, really important, played a significant role, and it deserves a lot of credit. I mean – you know, from being booed to sticking with it, I mean, sounds like a complete class act. And it's, it's refreshing, in my opinion, in college football to see uh, someone like Brendan Armstrong fight through this adversity. When we talk, you know, throughout the week about a guy like Jalen Scott, could he have transferred out? Absolutely gone somewhere and started. He did not. Look how well he's playing now. I'm just using those two as examples. Um, again, it's refreshing instead of, uh, picking up your ball and going home, which is what people across the country seem to do, uh, to see kids like this continue to be team players and work hard. And, 
you know, I think at the end of the day, Corey, they can't, you can't play football forever. Uh, these are the type of things that really help propel guys the rest of their lives. And it's encouraging. It says a lot about the program. And again, that's something that Jalen Scott was able to do too, uh, which you know, I highlighted earlier this morning, we wrote a story about him and Dave Doran spoke about you know, his resilience and uh, he came up with a big game tonight too for NC state, um, you know, nine tackles. He was second in the team in tackles uh, and then had that pass breakup a big UB hit, and then, um, you know, three solo tackles on the night for him. So, again, he continues to come up with big plays. Um, but let's uh, let's continue on the offensive side of the football because you talked about <clears throat> – let me try to clear my voice here. <clears throat> Goodness. You talked about, uh, you know, Kevin Concepcion and, and what he's able to do uh, in this offense. We saw him be, you know, again, multiple for NC State. Didn't end up getting into the end zone, but – you know, 22 yards as a running back, uh, 61 yards as a, a receiver, quote unquote, 36 of those yards came out of pop pass. But, um, you know, he just continues to be a guy that for NC State, when they had those big productive drives, even though he wasn't the guy to get in the end zone, he was the one that sparked it. Uh, that 16 yard reception that he had late in the fourth quarter was the first first down they had the entire second half. Uh, and he ended up getting another uh, catch later in that drive before they ended up getting the touchdown off of Kendrick Raphael. Um, so what does he do to spark this offense? Uh, well, I think first, before you, you you talk about him, for all the criticism the offense has received, I think Robert and I deserve credit. He realizes, he sees what we see, that they're incredibly limited personnel-wise offensively. And at this point in the season, Kevin Conception is not just a receiver. He's just a football player. I mean, he is a, a running back. He is a receiver. I mean, he – just needs to be involved. And, and what you're doing by putting him in the backfield court, you're just giving him more touches. He had 11 touches tonight. I, I think it goes without saying that week, at, week in, week out, he needs to have between 10 and 15 touches. There's really no excuse and no way that State can finish strong if he's not involved, you know, all the time, if that makes sense. I, I think it has to be that way going forward. Would you like him not to have to shoulder such a load? Uh, heavy load at 18 years old, uh, of course, but we are where we are in, in you know, what, nine games in, you just don't have any help. He does not have any consistent help around him, and that's not a shot at the guys, but there is enough data, there's enough to support that statement. We are where we are, and it's like I was talking to a source earlier this week, and I, and I, I asked him, I said, well, you know, what do you think the offensive adjustments are going to be? And they said, well, there aren't any. They go, we are – the state, NC State is who it is at this point offensively. So, you know, you, what does that mean? That means you lean on your best player, and he is far and away their best offensive player at this point. Yeah, and I mean, you know, the one thing I will say to kind of combat that a little bit, like, look, it didn't, it's not that the offensive system changed, but you kind of implement some new guys that I think are starting to become, you know, bigger parts of this team. And, look, I'm not going to say that Jordan Poole is going to suddenly become your top running back or anything along those lines, but – you know, look, if he's got dependable hands out of the backfield, he made that 12-yard reception. That's a pretty big play for him. We've also seen him be a great pass blocker, which is not something that NC State has shown so far uh, when it comes to that running back oh, it's position. Been a major problem. Yeah, and then you had Dakari Collins, a, a big catch tonight for him. Only had one catch, but it was 17 yards. It's good to see him kind of haul one in. Uh, Terrell Timmons, um, I know it only says one reception for 15 yards, but that one reception, he kept the play alive. Another opportunity that he had, despite the fact that MJ Morris threw his, his first interception, his only interception later in the drive, Terrell Timmons keeping plays alive and continuing to try to, you know, look, if, if MJ Morris is going to keep the play alive, he's going to try to find ways to get open. And he did that twice tonight. One led to a DPI. The other one led to uh, one reception for 15 yards. And, and you're seeing other guys that are, you know, kind of stepping up in this offense too. I mean, I'd still love to see more from Michael Allen. One carry for him on the night for one yard. Um, you know, he's not being asked to do a ton right now for this offense. But, again, part of that is because he's not really getting to his spots. He's not getting, you know, chunk yardage. Kendrick Raphael only given three carries tonight, but he gets a touchdown on one of those. He bowls through a linebacker that's trying to you know, trying to get him down, and he gets a 31-yard uh, rushing touchdown. So there's still more guys in this offense that need to step up. But the thing I love about what Robert and I is doing it's not pretty. I mean, it's it's dirty in general. Like you're having, you're having to do 
dirty things to be able to find ways to get this this uh, i'm not saying dirty like in a bad way like like they're they're playing dirty but i'm just saying like you have to be grimy uh and that's what this that's what this offense is doing right now and finding ways to you know, try to put something together to be it's not perfect complimentary football but like they're at least doing well, enough to be able to find ways to to put points on the board at times I, I think everybody can see at this point again we keep hammering home how limited state is offensively right now and if anybody knows that it's robert and i what does that mean that means that you have to try to control the ball i mean here we are Corey, the second week in a row what were they i know they were under 50 offensive plays last week they're at 48 this week i mean to win games with that the lack of just sheer plays i mean you're not you're not getting a lot of reps offensively every game and I, my one criticism of all this would be the rotations at the running back position and the receiver position, I think NC State would really benefit from cutting those down significantly. And But, uh, again, I don't think that's going to happen at this point. I think we're going to continue to see what we're seeing right now. And yeah. a win is a win. That's all I can say. But uh, I, I know, Robert, like I said, we've talked. Robert and I have gotten his shared criticism, but – I think any reasonable person can look at NC State's personnel and say, okay, here we, we know what we have and it's not a lot. So we just have, this is how they're going to have to win, regardless yeah. of who they're playing. Could they have a game where they score four or five touchdowns or sometime in the next three weeks? Yeah, sure. But this is never going to be a great offense. There's just too many question marks and not enough playmakers. And that's going to have to be addressed in the offseason. Yeah. So with that in mind, is what it is right now. yeah, I mean, I, you, you can, we can criticize MJ Morris. You know, he's got to be better. I mean, he is getting absolutely crushed every, he took some, I mean, just massive hits tonight. I mean, and then yeah. I think the, the thing that just continues to worry me as we go down the stretch is the, uh, if there is, and you know, you want to celebrate a win is the offensive line play. It is just um, not to say they didn't do some good things tonight. But there are so many plays every game where somebody comes in untouched and they hit the quarterback or they either stuff a running back. That is is the most disheartening thing at this point. But again, we'll focus on the positives that they were able to get the win tonight. Yeah, and the one thing I will add to that too, I'm looking at uh looking at the stats here in front of me, uh defenses in the ACC. I mean, look, the defenses they just faced, Duke still remains number one. And scoring defense, um, you know, Louisville uh, sits at number two. Again, it's they they benefited from playing NC State. So uh, they gave up. Duke gave up three points. The Louisville gave up ten. But Miami was the number four scoring defense. Clemson's the number five scoring defense. You know, the next few teams that they're facing, Wake Forest is number nine in the ACC. North Carolina is number ten. That's the team they'll face at the end of the season. And then Virginia Tech right now currently ranked number seven. So all of the defenses they're going to face down the stretch are worse than the ones they face so far. Look, all those defenses have ways that they can beat you in different ways. Obviously, you know, UNC's pass rush has been one of the better one of the better ones in the ACC. Certain guys have been able to step up for them, but their, their defensive uh, secondary continues to be a liability at times. Can NC State take advantage of that? If you can, then your offense can get going. If you're able to do that against Wake Forest next week, which a lot of teams have been able to get you know, points on the board against Wake Forest, surprisingly enough. Clemson, not one of them a couple weeks ago. But you know, if you're NC State, you're able to find enough ways to be able to put points up on the board, you know your defense is able to hold suit for you. Uh, and I, th- I just feel like you know, these have been the toughest tests for them when it comes to defenses they're going to face. If you're able to find a way to, to get through these, uh, then potentially there's a way to be able to you know, close this thing out. And I'm not saying like, Oh, they're going to definitely win the last three games, but there's there's enough opt- reason for optimism for the offense to potentially be able to kind of 100%. put hundred percent more up. Yeah, one hundred percent. And I think too, when you look at this offense going forward, it feels like they just need a half or maybe even a quarter where they have sustained success. I'm telling you, maybe you go out against Wake next week and just. Suppose they score two touchdowns in the first quarter. I just think about how big that would be for a unit that has yeah. struggled so badly. Um, again, I, I'm a big believer in when a unit like his, his has the limitations that they have offensively and has struggled week after week. 
early success in a ball game can really, you know, set the tone for a for a you know a struggling unit. And I think going to Wake next week, that would be my hope. I would hope they come out aggressive. Um, Wake Forest is a down year for them. I think we're all comfortable saying that. We know the the history there, and it's not been a, a place that's been kind to NC State. But I'd like to see them go out next week, be aggressive. You know Kevin Conception is going to be a big part of the offense, but, man, maybe if you could really try to – I know they're not going to limit the receiver rotation, which is one of my biggest complaints, but try to get somebody involved consistently consistently outside of him. I think that would really go a long way. And then just being a threat in the run game, uh, it, I, you have to have attempts. I was talking to multiple people this week. Even if you don't have success, the attempts take time off the clock. They give your defense a rest. And, and at this point, the defense needs all uh, the rest it can get, considering it's on, it feels like it's on the field all the time. Um, and, and I think this is something, obviously, you can build off of. But I think if you look at the final three games, maybe next week is a way to kind of jumpstart this offense. I think that has to be the hope if you're NC State. Yeah, time of possession tonight, 35-16 for Miami, 24-44 for NC State. Uh, and the offense was able to produce 20 points. Yeah, it's almost six. a quarter more of, of possession time. That's a lot. And, you know, what do they run? Yeah. Let me look at this right quick. 70 plays. 70 to 48. Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's a lot. <laughs> it's a 22 more offensive plays. And, and last week the disparity was Some even great larger. analysis there. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it, it, it's it's not staggering. I'm, I don't know what the difference was last week, but I feel like it was even yeah. bigger against Clemson. I'll say it, it was, was 80 plays maybe. That's a lot of defensive plays. For like 46. Yeah. yeah, I think that is even more impressive. Because I don't think, Corey, I think we would all agree – Outside defensive line, I don't think NC State's extremely deep anywhere anywhere yeah. other than the defensive line, what I'm saying on the roster. I mean, you got four linebackers you feel comfortable playing, you got two veteran corners, two to three safeties. I mean, you're not you're not deep and you're still yeah. managing to do what you're doing. And I think that the scheme and the individual performances you're getting each week, but highlighting that is the the, the heavy heavy lifting a limited number of players are doing it's it's really impressive while at being asked to play extended snaps yeah i mean you know look the one thing i will add as well for nc state i mentioned the upcoming schedule for them um, but at the same time you're getting a little more continuity each and every single week with the same guys you're seeing you know the same offensive linemen early on there were several mistakes but nc state ended up with four penalties in tonight's game so again you know as I said, the first two drives uh, were rough for NC State. The the face mask penalty, which you rarely ever see, but it was pretty egregious uh, on MJ Morris. And then the pre-snap penalty again uh, for the offensive line. I'll take that back, five penalties for NC State for 48 yards. So, again, you know, for, for NC State, there, there's certain things that you're seeing from an optimism standpoint that, you know, are continuing to come together. But, yeah, I mean, first three drives, three, three and outs, uh, not great. So we'll, we'll continue to see this this offense hopefully be able to evolve and and add some more wrinkles. Um, last thing I wanted to talk about here too. Actually, I did uh, had Chris uh, point out. He said, "Do we still have a path to the ACC championship game?" Technically, yes, but uh, you'd have to hope for Louisville to lose to both Virginia and Miami. Look, Virginia's looked better, but they're going they all on the road. Self destruct, basically. They're they going. Yeah, I mean, they're going on the road to uh, to Louisville on Thursday in a short week after a loss. Uh, and then the next week, um, Louisville will have time uh, before going to Miami. They'll have a few extra days. So there's there's technically still a chance. But since you lost to Louisville, you lose that head to head in order for NC State to get there. You'd have to have Louisville have three losses. And I just don't see that. They play Kentucky at the end of the season. Just yeah. so clear. Yeah. I think the bigger story in that is Florida State's already clinched and there's, what, three weeks left in the season. I think that makes it so hard. You're depending – everything hinges on Louisville and, and the people ahead of you and for one spot, not two. So one spot's gone, and that makes it really hard at this point. Uh, Louisville would basically have to self-destruct, like I just said, down the stretch. Uh, and that is a game, and we've had – you've had them through the years where it's just a heartbreaking situation for a, a program like NC State. Um, we can go back and we can talk about 
all the the tough situations they've been put in the past. But you know, you give up what thirteen points, and you should win that game ninety nine of a hundred times. And that was the one time that you just didn't. You just didn't get it done offensively, and it. I really hate it because yes, yeah, six and three, seven and two looks a lot better than six and three, and that's where you would be. You would control your own destiny, and I think in college football that is the most frustrating part. The margin for error is so slim, and you very rarely control your own destiny, and that that is where NC State is with that loss, unfortunately. Yeah, um, and Chilton pointed out here um, said I heard. Uh, this is the first time since 2011 we've held an ACC opponent to zero touchdowns. Any idea if that's true? I'm not entirely sure, to be honest with you. I haven't been able to go back and look through it. But uh, the last time they held an opponent, we were we were almost we thought that we had it um, yeah. was was 2016 against uh, Notre Dame. Uh, they held them, but that was also obviously in a hurricane. Mm -hmm. Another hurricane comes to NC State and they're able to hold them without a touchdown. So I'll just continue with my puns for the see moment. what you but, did there. Yeah, yeah, wonderful, right? <laughs> And that's with words. absolutely no points left. Um, all right, last thing I wanted to touch on here. Let's. Um, I got a lot of people pointing out. Uh, Kelly pointed out that uh, you can clear up my voice with uh, with some whiskey. Um, and and Chris notably pointing out uh, they don't exactly have that available. I'm still in the Carter Finley press box, so don't exactly have that available to me readily. So um, <laughs> I will just continue on with whatever voice I have left. <clears throat> wanted to touch on this as well. Um, 78th win for Dave Dorn in his time at NC State. A historic win for him. You've been pointing it out for weeks. Every single – the last uh, the last uh, point that you've had, you know, number to know for NC State was, you know, three wins for Dave Dorn until he reached just 78. Two wins. Earlier today it was one win. Uh, this is a, you know, a huge win for him. I mean – you know, you surpass Earl Edwards, a guy that spent 16 years with the program. Earl Edwards finished with a 77 and 88 record. Dave Dorn is now 21 games above 500 overall. I know everybody likes to point out he's 40 and 46 in, in ACC. Um, you know, if you'd like to take maybe one of those years, like the first year away where he went 0 and 8, seems a little better. But look, uh, he hasn't always done particularly well in the ACC. But right now, winning record in the ACC, despite – you know, having to completely overhaul uh, parts of this offense and, and refigure things out. Should, you know, what do you have to say about uh, about Dave Doran? And first of all, the job he's done this season to get to this mark, but also the job he's done, you know, over time to to get to this point uh, with NC State. Well, I think we've both, and a lot of the media have been critical, and uh, there have been ups and downs, but you can't argue five of the last six years, they've won at least eight games. They've won nine games three times in that span. That would make you one of the better programs in the ACC. That's not an opinion. That's not me being a homer. That's not you being a homer. They have been one of the better, more consistent teams in the league for the past several years. You're bowl eligible again. You have a chance if you went out to win nine regular season games, or we put, or we're getting a little far ahead of ourselves, sure. But, you know, the only thing you can really bang on is they haven't got the 10 wins. They haven't got the conference championship. That is uh, kind of still hangs in the balance. Will that be something he can accomplish in the future? I don't know. But from where he started, like you said, Corey, the 0-8 season, that we both – I mean, everybody can remember. They had the worst roster that, you know, I can remember. Uh, far and away the worst roster in the ACC when he took over, personnel-wise. So – you know, he's done it the right way. I think his players love him. He does a lot off the field, has kind of, you know, really emerged as, as a leader, just not only for, for the football program, but in Raleigh, and has really kind of ingrained himself. Uh, deserves a lot of credit. You, know, you have to be honest and, and admit when, you know, if you're going to criticize somebody, when they deserve credit, you have to also give it to him. And, again, Beating Clemson and beating Miami back-to-back -back weeks, I don't care what type of year both those schools are having. They're going to have personnel players on both those teams that are going to make it incredibly hard to win. And here you are. You've won those after being dead to right against Duke. I mean, again, I've never felt, or I don't know, you know, in, a, in recent memory as low as I did about the expectations for NC State as, as, as I did after the Duke game. I think we were both on that same thing, on that same, same plane. So – he deserves a ton of credit. He really does. And I think his staff does. And more importantly, the players, um, they have showed a lot of resilience. And 
I don't really have anything else I can say. Yeah, and I mean, you know, that's that's one thing about it. Like, I think a lot of people, you know, and I I didn't see this necessarily, so don't don't quote me on on saying this as you know I'm saying that the team quit on him or something like that. I saw a lot of people pointing out, you know, man, it looked like the team quit on him, you know, against Duke. It looked like the team gave up against Duke. It looked like the team was still fighting there at the end, but just could not figure things out. Continued to shoot itself in the foot way too many times. You're seeing this team has has not given up any belief uh, in what Dave Doran can bring them. And I think the having that bye week, getting that kind of renewed energy uh, was was huge for this team. And and not only were they able to focus on themselves and the issues they were having, you've seen them be smart about the way the things that they've changed. Like, look, hey, we're having a ton of pre-snap penalties. Let's go start huddling. Like that's that's something that seems minor. But in this day and age of, of college football and football in general, like, teams just don't huddle anymore. Like, it's just such no. a rarity. Miami was only one of the only teams that NC State's going to see all season that truly huddles. Uh, and so for NC State to continuously do that week in and week out now shows, again, like, we're just, we have to be smarter about the way we, we handle our business. And, and those are the types of things that Dave Doran has done throughout his tenure to, to help kind of reinvigorate a team the only times you haven't done that is first season in 2019. He's able, finding ways to do it again this season. Yeah, I think if you, you just take a you want a simple approach, he is maximizing what you can accomplish with the personnel that he has on this roster. Mm-hmm. Um, again, I go back to outside of defensive line, you don't have great depth anywhere. Um, you have five to six offensive linemen. You probably feel comfortable playing. You've got one good receiver. Some talented backs, but they're not proven. A young quarterback who is still trying to find his way, uh, not incredibly deep in the secondary. You've had some injuries. And then linebacker, Corey, you're what, like I said, four that you feel comfortable with playing right now. So I I think that is probably one of the bigger takeaways that doesn't get discussed enough is what they're doing with less. And – it is a sign of a very well-coached team and a program that is in a good spot. So, again, you you feel really good to be 6-3. and three. I think you have a legitimate chance to win out. Will it happen? Who knows? But with that in mind, you're not where you want to be, I think, as a program pers- from a personnel standpoint. And that, not to get too far off the rails, but that is where the offseason is you know, is going to be so big for NC State. One of the bigger off-seasons in program history, I would argue, because you've got so many question marks, but yet you're still finding a way to be semi, I mean, you're successful in the field. You've got twice as many wins as you do losses. And again, given what they have on the roster, that is incredibly impressive. Well, and I was going to say too, is, you know, you're, you're finding out more of what you need. And obviously the needs are along the offensive line at wide receiver. You know, maybe do you look to pick up potentially another running back in the portal just to yeah, have you got a better quarterback player. receiver I mean, I mean they need well, 15 guys yeah and i was going to point out i mean i think the biggest thing that I'm, I'm taking away from some of these games you're seeing guys on both sides of the ball slowly step up you know the the concern again for the defense was going to be you're losing peyton wilson you're losing jalen scott you're probably losing shaheen battle there's a chance you're losing aiden white like if those guys step away then you know, you're left with a lot of really young guys. As but long guys as like Tony Kevin Gibson's Kevin. there, as long as he's up yeah. there, I don't, I don't, I think the defense will be good enough. I think it is more, and I, and I feel like as NC State goes into the offseason, their defensive players are going to want to play for him. They know he's one of the best defensive coordinators in the country. The offense, I think, is going to be a little bit more, although the opportunity is there for you to come in and make an impact. I think it's going to be a tougher sell, unfortunately. Um, a lot of this, if we're being brutally honest, Corey's going to come down to money. How much can you pay kids? <laughs> and it's, well, that's, uh, I know that makes certain people uncomfortable, but that's where we are um, in yeah. college football. So support those collectives. A lot of guys are doing some heavy lifting. Support those. I know we're talking a post-game podcast, but it feels like every chance we have to say that, it, it needs yeah. to be said. And those who can't wrap their heads around it, I'd really encourage you to to try to change your line of thinking. Well, not only like, and the thing I'll point out too, is it's not only like, Oh, I feel grimy about giving money to college kids. Well, first of all, you know, every, I, I, I mean this in like the most positive way, but everyone's doing it. Everyone's doing yeah, it first of all, yeah. but also like if you, if you don't know 
anything about Savage Wolves, you don't know anything about Pack of Wolves and IL Collective, go look at them. Go check out the things that they're, they're doing. They're not like, just giving money to kids. There is yeah. obligations they have to meet and all that. And, you know, and no, doing great things in the community it. too. Yeah. And, and I'm not yeah. going to get on this soapbox, but you can't sit there and complain. And state's got a wonderful fan base about not winning and not getting players without the, there's no question that you've got to support it. You either get with it or you're going to be irrelevant. And I think, you will see over the next couple of years the programs that have their stuff together and fan bases who adapt and are willing to accept the current and the future of college football will be the most successful programs. NC State has a chance, passionate fan base, but you have got to be on the cutting edge. You've got to be creative from an NIL standpoint if you are NC State because you don't have this unlimited yep. budget like 10 to 15 schools in the country do. You know, they're one of the 99% of college football who's trying to figure all this out and, and doing the best they can, but it is, it's here to stay. And in an off season, that feels like it will be the busiest that we've seen. NIL is going to be the biggest factor of all of this. I mean, if you're talking about where you need to get better receiver offensive line, those are two positions similar in the NFL. What gets paid? Those type of players get paid. Well, guess what? They're getting paid in college. So that's where we are. Yeah. One other thing I'll point out, I mentioned earlier, you know, the next three defenses they're facing, not as good as the defenses they face over the last three weeks. This is a prime opportunity. If you're Robert and I, if you're MJ Morris, if you're, you know, the other playmakers in the system, a prime opportunity to, first of all, show what you have and show what this offense is capable of, but also to go, all right, let's uh, let's continue to to keep pushing all of these um, you know, all of these guys out there and so that we can, you know, find ways to fill these spots. Because if, again, like you said, if you're an offensive player and you're looking at the system right now, I still don't want to jump into it. Even if I'm going, oh, well, there's, there's plenty of opportunity. Well, guess what? Guys like Dakari Collins and Bradley Rosner and a couple others came in and, and they didn't do anything. Well, and you're not necessarily saying, yeah, exactly. So, so if you're an offensive player, like you got to see some things that are, that are going to give you a little bit of optimism. And I think they do have an opportunity to do that over these last three weeks. And another reason why this win is so big, I know people, you know, you don't think that getting bowl eligible is that big of a deal. You don't think that, you know, that extra month of practice is that big of a deal. It's huge when it comes to a team like this, that is still trying to find itself offensively. Like that's what this, that's what the defense was able to do over the course of that end of that 2020 season. Like you think back to, Yes, the loss to the loss to Kentucky sucked, you know, the, to close that season out that way. But one of the biggest reasons why that that month was so helpful was because you found other players outside of guys like Peyton Wilson and outside of Drake Thomas that stepped up and became those dudes for the next several years. That's what you get an opportunity to do in the month of December for NC State and, and continue to try to build uh, this team as a whole. Yeah, I think what it does is it gives you more clarity. And I think after 12 games, you have a good idea. But like you say, the extra practices, it's a chance for you to, okay, you have young guys that you feel really good about that are going to make that jump from year one to year two. You're even more confident after you have all the extra practices and the bowl preparation. Okay, well, maybe that changes your approach in the transfer portal. It is so important for NC State to have a clear plan when they go in the portal because they're one of the, like I said, 99% of college football where you don't have unlimited resources. So how you allocate that, those resources to construct your roster next year is incredibly important. Um, It is, you can't miss. There's not a margin for error, a big margin for error for NC State. It has to be incredibly diligent and and just prepared. How is it going to spend the X dollars that it has and to keep the current roster together, bring in guys and you got recruiting. So it is a, a juggling act that Dave Dorn has to do outside of coaching this team. Uh, It is an an enviable task and it is a, it just, it's going to continue to get tougher every year. Well, and you mentioned the creativity, like that's for NC state, when they've been creative in the past, it's ended up leading to some success. You know, you think back to a guy like Chandler Zavala, 
uh, one of you know a guy that was a D two All American. They bring him in, and he becomes what he was at NC State. Uh, Anthony Belton has been a starting left tackle for NC State for the past couple of years. Has he been perfect? No, uh, but he came in from the JUCO level, and he's became a starter for NC State. When you're going out there and looking, uh, that's you know look. And that's the thing is there's a big difference. Like I'm, I'm talking about basketball here. It's a little bit different. But like you think back to what Kevin Keats was able to do in the transfer portal two years ago, he was able to bring in creative guys that worked for the system. He brought in guys like DJ Burns. He brought in guys like Jack Clark that I know I ended up transferring again. But like guys that were productive, Jarkel Joyner was able to bring in. Like those guys were productive for NC State. And then this season he was able to go out and find all power, nearly all power five guys. For NC State, if you're it, the way that you're going to be able to have success in the portal is showing over these last three games what this team is truly about and continuing to find what you have. And then over that last month, find where you can be, figure out what you can be. And again, you can bring in guys starting what December 4th, I think, is when the portal opens. Is that correct? Yeah, it opens the 4th. And I, I just think NC State not to say you, you have to be aggressive, but at the same time you have to be selective because you can't afford to, in my opinion, can't afford to bring in guys who cannot challenge for us at least, at the least a spot on the two deep. And I would argue offensive line wise and receiver wise, Corey, you're going to need multiple starters, like not just guys. And, and is that realistic given whatever the budget is? I, I don't know. It's going to be tough. And a school like NC State is going to have to turn over every rock. And like you said, with Chandler Zavala is a perfect example, Division II guy. That you're really going to have to, you know, it's it's a, it is going to take a Herculean effort, if we're being honest, to address the needs that NC State has um, with the budget that it has um, in yeah. IL wise. Guys like Robert Kennedy. Uh, yeah. I mean, just a standout player this year, been one of the best yeah. nickels in the ACC so far this season. Uh, Red Hibbler, a Juco guy. That's the thing. You get creative. You find guys that fit. I think that's mean. the route for it's, NC State to be successful, yeah. if we're being really honest. Are you going to get the top 10 to 15 Juco guys in the country? Probably not. But I think from an offensive line standpoint, that's where I'm really watching. I think that NC State in future recruiting classes, to me, it makes sense. Instead of bringing in five high school kids, you bring in two and three or three and two. Uh, yeah. you've missed on so many guys and, and, you know, as encouraged as you are to be six and three, you're really struggling up front. Um, you know, you can't just having five, six guys that you only feel comfortable putting in a game in a, at the power five level is really, really hard. Yeah. And, and one thing I will say, I've, I've seen people say, well, the transfer portal is trying to like, is like, is like slapping a bandaid on it. It's not necessarily. It's it's providing, first of all, it provides somebody that has a veteran presence and potentially can be a starter for you. But it also provides a bridge for these guys that you're bringing in because and, not every single one of these offensive linemen that you're bringing in is going to be a starter after one or two years. college football is year, is year to year now. I think we, you know, yeah. Corey, we've been covering this a long time. And, you know, you look it back and it's all about the development. I mean, that stuff is so... I mean, you sound like a dinosaur when you're talking about that now. That's why people talk about red yeah. shirt. And you throw red shirt out the window. None of that matters anymore. It is year to year. If you're NC State and you want to remain competitive, you're going to have to turn your roster over every year. I would argue going forward, 12 to 15 guys, you're going to have to bring in every year because we see where they are now. And it is a credit to the program that you've only had 33 guys transfer in four years. But look at the toll that is taken on your depth. You have none. Mm -hmm. You have none at multiple positions. And really everywhere, like I said, except defensive line. And that is not sustainable. For NC State to be successful and to continue to be relevant, you're going to have to bring in 12 to 15 guys every year, maybe more at times. And you're not the only program. I mean, that is how it is going to be for the majority of the programs in college football outside the blue bloods. That's what we're looking at. And I, that's not an argument. I mean, it just, it, it's, it's, it's hitting people right in the face. I mean, you have, you have no choice. All right. So let's get back to this game. We have, we've gone completely off the rails. Uh, yeah. Let's wrap this thing up with, uh, with helmet stickers offensively. 
who would you give your two or, or game balls, whatever you want to call it? You guys get the point. Uh, who would you say on offense was your your guy that you want to touch on? Brandon Armstrong gets my game ball just for the mental toughness and the maturity to handle this situation. Most kids would have folded. Some probably would even have quit. Uh, here he is supporting his team, got booed, uh, what, what, a month ago or so, and here he is, eight carries for 51 yards, uh, just ran so hard, took some big hits, got up, uh, you know, that is a refreshing thing to see in college football. He could hang his head. He could agree not to be a part of this team, but uh, just deserves a ton of credit and I think appreciation from his fan base. Yeah, one thing I'll say is you know what's happening every single time he goes in the, every single time he goes in the game. He was the leading rusher for NC. He's putting his body on the line every single time. I mean, yeah. he's getting ready to get hit. He's not going to slide. He's got to be that so bulldozer every single time. So, yeah. Yep. I mean, a 15, 115-yard run for him, 6.4 yards per carry for him. So, yeah, I, I agree with you there. Um, and, look, you know, Kevin Concepcion finished in, within, for NC State. Again, the leading uh, leader in yards. He finished as the third leading rusher, uh, first and in, in in receiving. Granted, he probably could have finished – in both departments as the number one guy uh, because <laughs> 61 they made yards. work too. I mean, 61 they yards. Made... I was going to say 61 yards receiving uh, 36 of those was on a pop pass. So, uh, it was, you know, basically a handoff, but a, a nice little, you know, shovel yeah. pass forward. Uh, but the guys I'm going to give it to, I'm going to go back to, uh, to two running backs. I'm going to give it to the two guys that score touchdowns. Their first time scoring touchdowns, Jordan Poole's first touch. Uh, in a in a game as you know as a collegiate player obviously he was a running back uh in at the high school level uh but you know a guy that that made the transition to to linebacker it didn't work out but uh you know at the same time i mean he was able to uh to come back and he's he's playing a tough position at, at running back for nc state he's being asked to be that guy to be that that pass blocker so i think team kind of saw him and said all right if he's out on the field he's pass blocking now you show a little bit of a different wrinkle. So uh, I think this does give him a chance to be a little bit more of a, you know, an offensive piece for NC State. I'm not saying he's going to go out there and, you know, rush for 100 yards or, or catch, you know, six six balls. But, like, hey, if you're in the red zone and you can find a way to sneak him out there uh, and, and at the same time he's a, a great pass blocker for you, that's a huge piece that you really, really needed in this offense. And then Kendrick Raphael, you know, look, again, only three touches on the night. Uh, 31 of his 41 yards came on one carry, but that one carry just bulldozing through a dude. And it came on a drive for NC State where, again, as I said, they had not had a first down the entire second half. And he's able to you know, finish that drive with a 31-yard exclamation point to give NC State a two-score lead. Uh, so just say, you know, not a, not a huge night for really anybody offensively. But when you, do, when you have those types of plays, those are huge down the stretch. All right, so defensive side of the football, Michael, who are you giving it to? I mean, we could go in multiple different ways, but, I mean, his numbers are so staggering. Peyton Wilson, 16 tackles, including one for loss, two pass breakups, two quarterback hurries. Is this – he's – I don't know how is he not the – four and away the front runner for ACC Defensive Player of the Year, uh, All-American. I mean – Maybe Buckus Award, too. Yeah, I mean, if he continues to play remotely close to the level, I mean, and, you know, we don't follow everybody around the country, but how could you argue that he's not the Buckus winner? I, mean, I don't know. It's just um, the fact, the impact that he has week in and week out as a defensive player is is insane. Um, it's almost, you know, you, you know the quarterback. I, I compare this. You know the quarterback's going to be very impactful every week. He touches the ball every play. But Peyton Wilson is an imp as impactful defensively as any player I've ever seen. I'd argue at any level. I mean, he is – if you're watching NC State and you know nothing about them, it, he immediately pops. Every single play, he's always around the football. If he's not making a play, he's the next guy there. It's just incredible. And I think, Corey, you're at the point where teams are obviously, you know, developing a game plan around him. So – what I mean is they're allocating a lot of resources, blockers, keying on him, and double team, triple team. He continues to make play after play. Went over 100 tackles tonight. Yeah. I, I, you know, one of the best players that's ever played at NC State. And I, I you know, put this in my takeaways. 
all those awards aside, I mean, he's well on his way to having his name in Carter Finley Stadium. I mean, let's call yeah. it what it is at this point. I mean, he's going to be an All American, barring something unforeseen. Yeah. And again, like you said, he surpassed 100 tackles. Um, a guy that, you know, back in 2020, 108 tackles. He has 105 right now through nine games. So he has a chance to surpass his career high uh, next game through 10 games and it'll go over 110. I mean, I'm, I'm going to assume as long as he stays healthy, knock on wood here, but, you know, he's he's a guy that could you know, push well beyond that 120 mark um, if he mm-hmm. plays over the next two, over the next three games. Uh, and and you know, clearly not 100 percent. So he does that tonight. Yeah. I mean, he's got a little brace on his knee. We know practice minimally this week would be a nice way to put it without going into too much detail. And yeah. here he is, 16 tackles. It's just um, just crazy how well he's playing. I, you have to really watch him. I think when you watch him week after week, you develop a whole new appreciation for just the level he's performing at uh, during the 2023 season. Yeah, and again, shout out to all the guys that ended up with interceptions in this game. Devin Boykin, um, Aiden White, Brandon Cisse, kind of putting the exclamation point on it for NC State. Uh, but the guy I'm going to give mine to is Davin Van. Uh, Davin Van, again, only four tackles tonight, but he plays that that defensive line position, comes away with one sack, another uh, QB hurry, or actually three QB hurries in this game. He also recovered that fumble uh, that was a critical one for NC State to give them you know, the ball back after, you know, what looked like a drive where they were going to be able to, uh, you know, Miami might be able to take some momentum away, uh, but NC State was able to you know, take it right back in that game. So, uh, you know, just a shout out to Davin Van. I feel like we don't talk about him enough because the stats aren't staggering like they are with Peyton Wilson. Uh, but the guy is just one of the one of the most ferocious pass rushers in the ACC, uh, and a guy that's a very good run stopper too. He just does it all well, and I think it, he has a chance to have just as much, if not, you know, potentially a brighter uh, NFL future than than anybody else on the roster for NC State. Uh, and that's mainly because of the way that he gets after the football. His athleticism, his ferociousness as a pass rusher, I think versatility. He's so versatile; he can play everywhere. Yeah, exactly. And he's he's not a guy that's you know a six foot four defensive end. Like he's he's you know, and not to say oh this is who he is. I think I've made this comparison before, but like it's very similar to like an Aaron Noddle type of guy where he's just an elite pass rusher and somebody that can you know stop the pass, stop the run too, uh, despite you know not being one of the bigger guys on the roster. So. Um, a guy that has a chance to to have a bright NFL future and in, in the very near future, and obviously wears the number one because he's one of the biggest leaders on the team. So, uh, shout out to him. Also, lastly, we don't give enough credit to him, but Caden Newcastle, five punts again tonight, 223 yards. Um, you know, a guy like uh, Braden Narvison, two field goals tonight, hits both of them, one of them 19 yards, one of them 39 yards. But again. You need special teams to be exactly that. You need them to be special. And for NC State, they continue to be that way. Uh, and that's that's a big part of, of where this team is at, too. Any last thoughts before we wrap this thing up, man? No, I think you're right on the special teams. Uh, they are huge for this team, considering what they're facing offensively. And then the last thing defensively, I don't think we've given enough credit. I think NC State on the back end, coverage-wise, I mean, we talk about these plays, these tackles for losses, the sacks. Does the defensive line and the linebackers deserve credit? But if you rewatch these games every week, NC State's been really solid on the back end collectively from the nickels to the safeties, you know, to the corners. I think A. White is much more health, as healthier than he was a couple weeks ago. It clearly looks like he is returning to the all ACC form a year ago. And I think that is probably one of the more encouraging under the radar things given the way that college football has played with all the, the, you know, air raid passing. You're pretty strong on that back end. Are you perfect? No, but I think that has been one of the, like I said, under the radar things that we probably haven't discussed enough. The, there's been some a significant amount of coverage sacks and all these type of things that kind of go again under the radar. But I think this is a, this is a team defensively that I think can even play better. And that's, that's really scary to think about. They just continue to get better every week. They're well coached. You've got veterans. I really think you can ride this, these defense over the next three games and just play smart offensively and you will have a shot. All right. Well, I think that'll just about wrap up this podcast guys. Don't forget to uh, set your clocks back to uh, it's one 30 right now. It'll be uh one 30 again in one hour. So, uh, 
So look forward to, to seeing you guys all uh, in the next few days. Um, thank you to everybody for listening. And Michael, I appreciate you for jumping on, man, as always. I enjoyed it, man. We'll talk soon. All right, guys. Well, again, thank you to everybody for listening. We will talk to you again soon.